Hello everyone and welcome back to season 3 of the Fan Fiction Tapes. I'm your host today, Maya, pronouns she, her, and today I'm joined by... Dylan and his really weird hours. And hi, it's Cam. I'm back. My pronouns are she, they, whatever you choose to assign to me for the bit is completely fine. And I am our producer Ian, pronouns he, him. Today's topic is all about the book being better than the adaptation, and those of you who... We're never entirely too attached to a book series in the mid-2000s and entirely disappointed when the theatrical release came out. May not understand <laughs> what I'm going on about. I mean, yeah, a bunch, a bunch of directors got a bunch of rights and went, this should be easy. <laughs> and then, spoiler, it wasn't. Yeah, of course, it's not exclusive to just books into movies and just the early 2000s. As adaptations being bad is, I don't want to say like a constant, but it's been a pattern for a while. I mean, video uh -huh. games suffer the most, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they're, until very recently, it was believed there could not be a good video game movie. Yeah. There's a pretty good video game TV show. Yeah, it was like Netflix show, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, they made Arcane and they made The Last of Us and the, the Super Mario Bros. movie was good. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, we got free. <laughs> there was some OK stuff back in the day, but then it was like, even now it's like, oh, yeah, Halo. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> Thank you, Hollywood. This is trash. <laughs> And also, like, the original Super Mario Bros. movie. You guys ever watch that? No. I love, I love my brain a... cells too much. It's Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo as Mario and Luigi. Oh, dear God. All right. Bob, Bob I... Hoskins hates that, hated that movie. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I saw that as a small child. I think it is a suppressed memory. <laughs> <laughs> Just blocked it out. You should see the Goombas. Uh, I'll grab that while uh, Maya takes us into our topic. So, I think really the first time this kind of an adaptation must be bad was really <laughs> shattered. I would say might have been the release of Arcane. Mm -hmm. uh, in, was that 2021? No. I think so. No, no, not that long ago, I'm old. <laughs> Shush, don't make me think about the passage of time. <laughs> I don't need to think about that right now. Yeah, it was 2021. Mm, Moment of silence okay. as all of our bones crumble into dust. Yeah. <laughs> Ow, my back. Mm, felt. And th th there have been a couple of adaptations, actually, that were pretty good. Cyberpunk Edgerunners, to stick with the animated theme... Also a pretty solid adaptation. Well, yeah, I think people realize, hey, we're leaving a lot of money on the table by just not making something good, but also something that normal people can enjoy. Because maybe these stories are interesting enough and good enough that they don't need to be Hollywood-fied, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like there's a reason that these games were good in the first place. Of course, when it does come to adaptations and the video game to screen adaptation, whether it's small or big, it depends solely on the original game concept. Like when we talk about like sort of those older games and when they got adap adapted into like TV shows and stuff, it's hard because those games, most of them didn't have a narrative. You know, what what could you say about the original Legend of Zelda or the original Super Mario Bros, it wasn't until sort of the the SNES era that most of those big franchises actually got, like, narratives. But, and I, I think these days, like, people realize, oh, yeah, games are a, valley, a really valid way to create a narrative now. <laughs> Which was unappreciated for a long time. It's like, video games, those are for babies. <laughs> Like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Of course, video games are not the uh, only medium that gets this. Uh, we mentioned books earlier because that's the Percy Jackson movies. Uh, Ow. <laughs> My first experience was with this was when they tried to make the Animorphs TV show. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no. I do not see that ending well. Uh, it did not. It got canceled after like two seasons. Okay, one and a half seasons. <laughs> season one was 20 episodes, season two was six. Oof, and oof. it aired from September 1988, 1998 to September 1999. The technology was not there for the special effects. Mm. Yep, that's that's a pretty common driver of stuff like that. And there's there's a couple of, I think, pretty famous adaptations that we haven't mentioned so far. The MCU and the... Mm bevy of superhero movies that were spawned in the mid 2010s because th those were adaptations and most of the mcu for a long time was pretty good like it, it was solid films they were enjoyable and not pencils in your fingernails i mean sure but they're also were mostly trash adaptations <laughs> you know that it's sort of the thing with comics is like comics have the least amount of respect for the original t material because <laughs> people just usually pick and choose like eh, this is fine i'll take an element from this and make it into a movie like it's hardly ever that you just see someone adapt the pages of a comic into you know a show or something which is very crazy considering that when we look at like manga to anime adaptations that's mostly what they do is they literally just take it i think some of that is that comics the, the way that the comics that we understand have been around for a long time right ironwood ironwood oh. i have too much ruby on the brain iron man batman etc etc are characters that have been around for a long time Mm -hmm. upwards of 60 years there's a lot of storylines that have been written rewritten erased redone it's why i hate american comics by the way <laughs> I, hate, I hate that trash it's mega narrative i think part of why i like you know because i'm admittedly pretty picky about the like superhero movies that i'll watch mostly because a lot of it at this point feels like y'all were saying, like, you know, overdone and trite, kind of. Like, they're just doing it to make a buck. But part of why I really enjoyed the two Into the Spider-Verse films was because you could tell that it wasn't... A, it was a very fresh take on the story with representation that was relevant without being tokenizing. And B, it was also a love letter to animation. You could tell that the people involved in the storytelling at every level took great care and great joy and pride in what they were making. And that is, I think, what in part draws people to art in all of its forms and storytelling. And it's not something that we see a lot in this era of media and storytelling, unfortunately. So I think part of the reason why people enjoyed it was because it was refreshing in the level of investment that was put into it. Um which is why I liked it and actually watched them. <laughs> <laughs> I have met, I have I have lots of opinions about like book to film adaptations so or, or book to TV adaptations. So when we get there, that's when I will harness my overcaffeinated energies. Don't you worry. <laughs> Something I wanted to touch on this episode is why does this happen? Because this is certainly a pattern. There are and have been plenty of examples. I'm certain that we have not exhausted them, and that you, our listeners, can think of several that we haven't mentioned yet. And there's, there's a lot of reasons that can influence why an adaptation is bad. Some of it can be that the original author isn't really consulted, or original authors, depending as it may be, aren't consulted in the creation of the adaptation, and as such, it's handed to a writing room that doesn't necessarily super understand uh, what they've mm -hmm. been asked to adapt. Uh, this is, I think... The primary issue with the Halo TV show that's going on is that the 
writing room around that show does not understand or care about the original narrative of the Halo games and just like the aesthetic. Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. You see that like a, a lot with like, it's like, oh yeah, I don't respect this because I'm a Hollywood writer and this is a video game, <laughs> which is like, okay. It, it's clear that when, you know, I, I know it's like sort of weird to say, but maybe get people who like <laughs> what you're adapting. Because I think that's very important with adaptations more than anything. Is get people mm -hmm. who like the original thing. Not even love, just like. <laughs> and I find sometimes even with that, like, even if it's not a perfect adaptation, this this is going to be me going down a, a verbal rabbit hole for the next couple minutes. But even if it's not like a perfect adaptation, if you can tell, meaning you, the viewer, can tell that whoever it was that was responsible for the adaptation likes, if not loves, the source material, the differences go down a lot easier. And obviously this is like person to person, there, right? There are a lot of people that are like purists, you know, it has to match the book no matter what. And I'm definitely like that in some ways and other ways I'm not. Um, but this isn't a perfect example, but it's the first one that came to my brain. Actually, there's, there is a perfect example. Hold on. I, I, there's two to choose from. I'm going to be good and pick the one that's a, a book to TV show adaptation. So I, since I was 16, 17, have been a fan of Lee Bardugo's Six of Crows duology. Um, Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom were very fundamental books for me that changed my brain chemistry. It's fine. I'm very normal about them. But when Netflix announced that they had received the rights from Lee Bardugo to adopt her works into a TV show... I was very skeptical because Netflix is very hit or miss with their original series. But when I watched the show, because to me, you could tell that the actors, the producers, the directors like did their research and actually read the books and engaged with the source material, even though the TV show kind of reads like to reference fan fiction from one of our earlier episodes we did together. It reads kind of like an AU of the original story. The, the bones, the vibes, the character types, the mannerisms, like all the things that really matter to make it feel to me like an authentic adaptation were all there. So even though like the story beats were slightly different, plot points were kind of mashed up, like you can tell that it was a, in a lot of ways, a love letter to the story. And you could also tell that the actors had read the books. They knew what they were about. And so to me, that was still a pretty good adaptation. I know a lot of people disagree with me, um, but even though it had flaws, it was still a pretty darn good adaptation due to, in large part, because you could tell that people loved the source material. People involved in the production on the back end, people involved in the production on the front end, like the actors, loved the source material. And also the author was involved in the creation of this TV show. So I'm sure that also added some accountability there. Um, but... Yeah, I think that that, and I saw it also with a recent um, anime slash manga to live action adaptation that I watched. Was the live action good? That depends on who you ask. But to me, I could forgive a lot of things because it was clear that the stuff that mattered made it in there because it was a love letter to the source story. And so it made for a really fun watch, uh, even though it wasn't similar in a lot of ways to the anime at all. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's um, like why the D and D movie that recently came out—I say recently, it's been almost a year now—why that was good and did well, because the writers, the actors, they cared about what they were adapting and they were having fun doing it. A lot of the mm -hmm. um, previous adaptations of D and D to film or TV show have been questionable. Uh, in quality at best. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I went into the movie fully expecting it to be just a B movie at best. I was I was like, you know what? It's going to be a B movie. That might be a little bit fun to watch. And it was so much more than a B movie. Yeah, no George Seinfeld. Uh, <laughs> but there is a lot to say when it comes to adaptations because you see there's like a full like rung of like okay th this was like a one-to-one -one adaptation of everything and it's like and then you have like this is literally just the title <laughs> and this is a completely different story you've told with barely the mm -hmm. same characters and like there's a full breath of that 
And it's mm-hmm. very fascinating to see when we talk about adaptations because adaptations yeah, land somewhere along that line. And it's very fun to like pick up a thing and go, okay, where along this very long line do, do you fit the piece yeah, of like, media? Which are you? <laughs> yeah. Because there are some things on like that side that are like, you know, like the uh, TV show The Boys. Not like it's it's not like the original source material as much, but it's way better than the source material because <laughs> the original boys' graphic comic is crap. <laughs> Doesn't it like just kind of basically take the characters' names and loose concepts, and that's about it? Pretty much, yeah. Oof, because. The original source material is made it by a guy who h- hated superheroes and just wanted to kill superheroes in weird ways and have superheroes be depraved, weird mm-hmm. sex freaks. Whereas the show is more like a commentary on celebrities and capitalism and um, the US and, and the media. Power. Yeah. And it has a lot more interesting things to say than the comic, which the comic is just like, Superheroes suck and they should all die. (laughs) Interesting. But then, and obviously there are some times that you see something adapted and it's adapted as close as it could possibly, uh, possibly be and it's not as good in that medium. Can't Hmm. think of any of it on my head. Can you guys think of like accurate adaptations that weren't great? Accurate adaptations that weren't great. Uh, Ash. Because I'm sure they exist in some way where it's like, yeah, you got 99% of the story right, but it's like, they just didn't work. <laughs> hmm. I can't really think of any, but I also don't really tend to watch many adaptations. Um, There was a term you mentioned, one-to-one adaptation. And I kind of want to uh poke at that a little bit because... I I want to posit something that I think explains another problem with a lot of adaptations. And it's that you cannot make a one-to-one adaptation. That it's impossible because any mm-hmm. piece of media that's, so book, movie, what have you, is made through a certain medium and there are unique features of that medium that do not exist in other mediums. In books, Mm -hmm. we can literally get the thoughts inside a character's head. We can literally receive their emotions because you can just tell us that. It's a lot more clunky. Do the same Mm -hmm. thing in a a video game or a movie or a play. Requires much more of a breaching of the fourth wall than it does necessarily in a book because of the way the, the narration works. And it's hard to get your audience as directly integrated with the perspective character as you can get to do in a game that's played through first person perspective because they they literally are the character you can't really do that mm-hmm. in a movie without it being very weird And I also think there's some, this is probably, this might be an unpopular opinion, but hear me out. I think there are some books where you shouldn't, you, the editorial, you, one, shouldn't even try to adapt them. Because the way that the story is told, the medium matters. The fact that it is a book matters. And the story is not going to be well adapted to a TV show or a movie because, for whatever reason, like, I... This is the unpopular opinion part. I've seen a lot of people over the years on Twitter and Tumblr saying that they really want the Locked Tomb series by Tamsin Muir to be adapted into a TV show or a book. And I am against that because so much of the story. I'm sorry, a TV (laughs) show or a movie. And I am against that 110% because so much of the way, especially parts of Harrow the Ninth are written, it matters the, the textual things you can only get in a book. You can't convey half that shit through animation or like live action it's just not possible let alone trying to cram it into a what two hour runtime if it's a movie um like 
I, I just really, if, if it ever was adapted into a visual media, I simply would not watch it because I think that it would just be doing the story dirty to try to adapt that into a limited form because the way the story is set up and the fact that it's in book form matters. There are some stories where it doesn't lean so heavily into, you know, the, the medium of delivery, such as being a book versus TV show or movie, that the adaptation requires a certain deft hand, such as the Disney Plus adaptation of Percy Jackson, the Olympians, and everywhere they went right versus the movies that we don't talk about and everywhere they went wrong. But, you know, those books lend themselves to adaptation in a way that some stories like The Locked Tomb just don't. Or like Max uh, Gladstone and Amal El Motar's novella, This Is How You Lose the Time War. It's the same sort of thing. There's too much to that that couldn't be shown well in a visual format because the point is that it's epistolary. It's told through letters. So it lends itself well to audiobook adaptation. It lends itself well to a book. But I can't really be sold on that as a film or a television show. So, um... There's my rant. That's my second rant of the day. There's just some books that I don't think should ever have visual adaptations because the, the heft, the meat, the impact of the story is going to be lost because of the delivery method change. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> yeah, I think there are potentially ways to do the locked tomb particularly, and then and it would almost have to be animated. I, I do, do not see it working mm. well live action. No. I think there are ways to do it, but it would be weird and it wouldn't be easy either. I think I think it would require a lot of experimentation just to figure out what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't like to say always or never because things surprise me, um, but it would be like multiples of my, my trusted friends would have to watch a, a TV animated whatever locked tomb adaptation and tell me that it was good before I would even consider watching it because <laughs> like, it just... It's one of those things that I think that the story delivery would be, in my mind, bad until proven otherwise, just because of what I know about the storytelling. And also part of that is because I'm me and I studied Tamsin Muir's writing from a craft perspective while I was in grad school because I wanted to, like, level up and get rid of some of my skill issues. But still, like, I don't know, it would be a really, really hard sell. It's also like a thing, though, that when you like something a lot, you're like, please don't ruin it. <laughs> yeah and yeah but also like i was really excited when i heard about the tv show happening um for percy jackson and the olympians because it was like oh maybe they'll get it right and a lot of that was because the author was involved this time he wasn't involved in the movies so i think there's something to be said for like the author being maybe i'd feel different if like tamsin muir was part of whatever screen adaptation the locked tomb was i don't know but the author's involvement is like almost an endorsement to me yeah, Riordan mm -hmm. was involved. Well, he was consulted and then promptly uh -huh. ignored. Ignored. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a series of leaked emails from him to the production team basically going, this is dog shit and everyone will hate it. And he was right. It was dog shit and everyone hates it. This is why you should listen to the author. So got saying. like two movies out of it. <laughs> Uh, Somehow. Yes. I And the first movie is, like, I'm not going to call it good, but it does not hit, hit the depths of terrible that the second one does. Mm. No, it doesn't. The second one was just bad. I don't really know what to tell you. Yeah, that one. And, like, again, like I wouldn't have had a problem with the movies if it was so... If it hadn't been so clear that it was just, like, they weren't paying attention to anything that made the source material the source material. Now, you guys, I, oh, you want? I, I was just going to ask if you guys had ever seen the, uh, the Death Note Netflix movie. I've, I, I've been no. shown... I've been shown the first, like, 20 minutes of it just enough to be like, this was an experience, I'm not sure I want to continue... <laughs> So the original Death Note is a cat and mouse game between uh, a guy who can kill people by writing their name in, in a book and a detective trying to catch him by deducing who is the killer. The Netflix movie is that, except a lot worse because you don't have the internal monologue. There's, yes. They, they introduce the second killer really quickly but also make her the bad guy instead of just having the first guy be the bad guy, like in the original source and the anime. 
and also decide to make it like Final Destination, where the deaths are really gruesome. When in the original oh. uh, book, uh, the original manga and anime, they just died of heart attacks unless specified differently. See, I've only seen the first episode of Death Note, but even I know that's a really bad adaptation. I've never oh, yeah. even seen Death Note, and I know that's a bad my, adaptation. My, my loved ones just put things in front of me and I watch them. I don't really know <laughs> what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they just like i imagine you're sitting there and slowly an ipad comes into view and yeah it's just like connect and i'm like i guess i'm watching this now usually usually it's hey it's thursday night we're watching anime here's what we're watching or it's sit down on the couch i'm gonna turn on this tv and you're not gonna know what's in front of you but i'm gonna know and it's gonna be fun which is how i ended up watching about half of madoka magica Oh my god. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You sounded so startled, Dylan. Um, but like Yeah, because I know what that means. <laughs> it was it was an experience. I will say though, like speaking of anime like and manga and whatever, so Netflix recently did a live action adaptation of a nineties anime slash manga called Yu Yu Hakusho. And mm -hmm. I I watched the anime and I, I really, really, really enjoy the anime. I went into the live action very nervous because the only other live action of an anime that I've seen from Netflix was just bad. It had no soul. Like, technically, it was very good, but it had no soul. It was bad. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to go into this, like, cautiously optimistic. And even though the live action adaptation took two storylines and, and merged them together, and I get the feeling that they did it largely because they were like, we might not get a second season so we got to do something with the five episodes we've been given, which I think says more about streaming as a as a the storytelling delivery system than anything else these days. But um, even though they did that, even though they made some changes to the stories because they took two plot points and merged them, um, my only real complaint about that is the fact that one of the characters' wigs looks terrible and like they didn't do anything to it. But that's my only complaint because you can tell that everyone involved in telling that story did their research loved the original anime and manga to death and wanted to make this a fitting homage to the story that has been really fundamental to people who enjoyed it and to anime and manga since like 30 years ago. And so it was actually really fun to watch if we ignore the really tragic wig on one of the characters. And I was like, okay, it is possible to make an adaptation that feels like an AU of the story, but also feels really accurate because the spirit of things was there. And sometimes if the spirit of things is there, you can forgive other stuff except for that terrible, terrible wig. I go on tirades about that wig. It's awful. I did better with like $60 and a cosplay wig. Come on, Netflix. There's no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, guys. <laughs> there, are, there are also a few instances, you know, where I, I have come across things that I think, God, this is so better than the original. Like, do you guys ever find adaptations that you're like, wow, how did you turn that into this? <laughs> My god. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's... Th I know there is one that Ian considers to be somewhat better than the original um, in a couple ways. And I actually... I wanted to mention this one anyways, because this one is, I think, proof that you can make something that is difficult to adapt, adapted, uh, mm -hmm. and that's Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, you kind of have to give up on entirely doing Tolkien's whole shtick with the books. You, you can't adapt Tolkien's style. You you have to drop that. I actually recently reread uh, Lord of the Rings during a trip. Um. And the movies are, at least if you watch them properly, over 11 hours long. And there is still so much that's just you, you can't really do because Tolkien will go on a tangent about random shit for ages. <laughs> I remember when I was younger, um, because the, the movies stuck with me better than the books did when I was younger for whatever reason. I remember when I was younger being confused about Tom Bombadil. <laughs> You're not alone about that. Many people are confused about Tom Bombadil. I mean, he's still confusing, but like... 
more in the case of what in the Sam Hell, <laughs> and less in the case Why? of what is his place in this world. Yeah, exactly. I was making a facial expression, but this is a podcast. <laughs> yeah, this uh-huh, is an audio uh-huh. format. <laughs> Speaking of limitations of certain media forms. Way to bring it back around. That was a real clever segue. Nice job. <laughs> N- nice drive. Were we going somewhere or? <laughs> I can keep, I can keep going. I'm just kidding. No, don't put a cork in me. Don't put a quarter in me. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, am I recalling that opinion correctly? Uh, yes, I do think that the uh, the Lord of the Rings um, movies by Sam Jackson are better than the Peter Lord of the Rings Peter books. Jackson. Peter Jackson. What did I say? Sam, Sam Jackson. Jackson. None of us. None of us are getting names or things right today. Like it's fine. We're doing amazing. <laughs> yeah, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy is is better than the the Lord of the Rings books, in my opinion. I'm tired of these motherfucking hobbits in my motherfucking ward mordor. Speaking of, why don't we talk about Mr. Who is called the Antithesis of Tolkien and his crappy book that got adapted? guys ever read fire and blood i don't know what you're talking about fire and blood is a collect it's a bunch of stories based in westeros which is george r body's world it's basically a bunch of prequel stuff that covers like like a hundred and something years of history in westeros is it's this not house no- of the dragon Yes, it adapts, uh, House of the Dragon adapts two novellas that Martin made, and both of those novellas got shoved into this, like, big book of other Targaryen stuff as well. Uh, But House of the Dragon is far better, (laughs) because the the, uh, source material is basically, uh, this happened, and no one actually really knows what happened because this is told from a perspective of a historian during the reign of Robert Baratheon, which is basically like the equivalent of a historian today talking about the, the I don't know, like 17 and 1800s going on. It's like, well, you're a historian, you're not like a narrative. <laughs> Whereas the TV show, you get told plain and clearly, Hey, this is what happened, and here is the narrative, and it's like, thank God. <laughs> like, there are levels to, like, George R. R. Martin's, like, original work. You have Game of Thrones, which is, like, really good. You have uh, Duncan Egg, which is, like, the best thing he's ever written. And then you have Fire and Blood, which was, my publisher asked me to write this. <laughs> <laughs> the energy communicated by my publisher asked me to write this. That's <laughs> that's a whole ass movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, Oh, that's... Oh, dear. (laughs) So it was like my publisher asked me to write this, and then a bunch of people put their heads together and was like, let's make what George worked actually good. This kind of inspired me to mention something that I think might be a little controversial. I'm waiting. Let's hear this. It's an adaptation that a lot of people think is pretty bad, but I actually think is really good. For reasons other than the quality itself. Okay. So I am a fan of The Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh, I have this huge copy that I believe has like several of the books in one volume. And I usually take it with me on road trips because it's, it's, you know, it's a good like eight to nine hour eater. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Douglas Adams' works, they have been adapted like several times. There was a radio version there's the book version and there is the tv there's not the TV, the movie uh, i'm familiar with the book and the movie i've not actually gotten my hands on the radio stuff and i suspect i probably wouldn't be able to get through it anywho the the movie is kind of bad uh it's very corny but i mean the whole series is but it's it captures the essence of the hitchhiker's guide and it it follows most of the plot, I think, fairly well. It's been a while since I have 
but either read the book or seen the movie. And it's it's got the vibe. It's it's silly. It's stupid. There's some absurd shit in there. But that's what I've been saying, right? Like you thank you for you said it better than me, but like sometimes the vibe makes an adaptation not forgivable that's a bit harsh but like it makes it like okay this might not be accurate to whatever the source material was but it still rips you know i mean to be clear this does not rip like it's <laughs> it rips to you in your estimation it's not like that's what matters <laughs> a good movie but it's got the vibe the vibe i mean you, vibe you get stuff like the sonic movies which are not like accurate to anything sonic it's just like his sonic doing some sonic things and it's like yeah, this this vibes. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about those. Uh, yeah. In terms of video game adaptations that did well, they're pretty like, fun. Th- those did very well, didn't they? Yeah, they got a third one coming out and a Knuckles TV show. <laughs> uh oh, that's not a good it, sign. What Il- Idris Elba as Knuckles? You don't want to see that? <laughs> no. More of that. <laughs> Repeated sequels and follow up content. Therein lies the path to mediocrity. I mean, Jim Carrey keeps on coming back, and he doesn't come back for anything, so... <laughs> hmm. Come on, Maya, they bring in Shadow in. <laughs> Shadow I still need the to Hedgehog. see those movies. Um, also, my, like, singular exposure to Sonic content is one time playing it on a friend's PS3 when I was in, like, elementary school. Oh, oh God, which game was that? <laughs> I don't f***ing know. Um, <laughs> is it, I'm like going, is it Unleashed? Please tell me it was Unleashed and not 06. Uh, it was not Unleashed because I rented that for a oh, brief period no. from Blockbuster. Um, oh, oh no. It, it really, oh, Blockbuster. For, for those of you that uh, are under the age of 20, uh, Blockbuster was like a physical Netflix where you could go and rent stuff. <laughs> physical space netflix it was it was actually real i mentioned blockbuster on tiktok and someone commented wait that was like a a legit place i thought people were just like but blockbuster was like goncharov like that y'all just like made it up and i'm like sitting there going no and then i checked the person's bio and they were like 14 i was like oh okay that makes sense okay maya it was either generations (laughs) unleashed or oh six was it Generations? Did you play 2D and 3D parts? I don't know. There were... Oh, no. There were very weirdly animated people in it. I... Oh, no, it was 06. <laughs> oh, no. I... This is so funny. Was there ever a, uh, a Sonic game that was released for GameCube? Yes. The Sonic Adventure 2 was on GameCube as well as Sonic Heroes. Look, this is I me think reaching I beyond one the of mental those. veil. Like, this is from a time period that I have very few memories of. Uh, basically, for you to understand, Sonic 06 is like one of those legendary bad games. Oh, yeah, no, I, I know that. I've heard about that. I'm on the Internet. Yeah, and you played it. You played it. By, you were in the trenches with us. Because I also played it. it Maybe bad. that's why I don't remember elementary school. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you played Sonic 06 one time. <laughs> I think more, like, reverse adaptations need to happen. Like, book adaptations of movies and TV shows that aren't just literal novelizations of exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because those are kind of boring. I've I've read a few of those. Uh, We we need more animated adaptations of live action things. I'm I'm sick and tired of everything becoming live action (laughs) as if live action is the pinnacle of media. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really weird thing, because I think in modern day, like, when I see, oh, this is getting a live-action adaptation, I'm just like, it'll probably not look great, it'll be too much CGI, and it will, and I'll be like, "Uh uh-huh. When something gets an an anime adaption, I get excited, because I'm like, yo, some animes go crazy, and they get some, you know, some people who are really into, like, this, it's like, ooh. Because ultimately, I feel like you're trusting Hollywood when you go live action, and Hollywood don't know shit. <laughs> Have you seen the Animatrix? The name is familiar. Animatrix was an anthology of 
animated shorts set in the Matrix universe. Uh, oh, I remember this. It explains more about, like, the history of the war between the machines and the humans, um, as well as, like, other people who have escaped the Matrix, and it's really cool. We need more stuff like that. Yeah, Ian, I was not even two when that came out. What next, Ian? You correct know, told to us correct about... this, trans woman. Correct this. <laughs> <laughs> I need What's to rewatch next? The Matrix. I've, I've been saying it for a long time, but I, I really need to rewatch it. <laughs> Ian will be like, hey, why don't you guys watch Bill and Ted's Excellent <laughs> Adventures? I've seen that. that. that Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures is a pretty good film. <laughs> no, the animated TV series that they made that had two seasons. <laughs> That's not necessarily a good sign. A lot of bad things have had only two seasons. <laughs> I also, like, I fully 110,000% co-sign the sentiment that, like, you know, live action is not the pinnacle of storytelling. And, and I don't know, like, I'm sure, I don't know, I'll be the first to admit, despite having, like, actually acted in a film before, it was an indie film, so I have no idea what, like, about, you know, hard numbers and budgets. However, I will say that I I want more animated stuff to the quality of Arcane, to the quality of Into the Spider-Verse. However, and you can bleep out what I'm about to say if you need to, Ian, but pay your damn animators. Like, that industry and its wild pay disparity and the abuse that they go through is not... It's not cool, and I don't like it. And that's that's... I'm not educated enough to make, you know, a really serious analysis of like you know oh here's what would need to change pay wise and you know working environment wise and blah 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 but like i don't want i don't want any media media to come on the back of like abusive work environments and i've seen so much in animation i have friends who work in animation or who used to work in animation most of them left because of how abusive the working conditions were how long the hours were and how sick doing that work made them and it's just like okay i'd rather not be entertained than have people work in those conditions it's just ridiculous yeah, it's it's really f um yeah. Not only are we not going to bleep that, not, we're not going to bleep that. We fully co-sign all of that. I may <laughs> turn up your volume on your track in the mix while you're saying that. Perfect. Okay. It was mostly the cuss word. I was like, I don't know how many cuss words I've said on this podcast already, but oh, like yeah. I didn't want to yeah. do it too much. <laughs> but yeah, do it louder for the people in the back. Pay your animators. There's don't there's only one back. cuss word I bleep and that's <laughs> it's because I say it too much. I mean, I say it a lot too, just not on the podcast. I, I have a, a post-it note on my monitor that actually says, don't say that word. <laughs> I, I don't want to... something like that. It would reduce how much work I make Ian have to do. Exactly. I don't want to make more work for people. My people-pleasing tendencies work it well in this case. I'm just going to start dropping a bunch of C-bombs as I'm allowed to do <laughs> being a British person. <laughs> okay, I'd probably block that, bleep that too. It hasn't come up yet. No. Really? Huh. <gasps> Maya, no! Maya's Honestly, like, I'm... Maya's like, oh, time to change that! <laughs> Swear word completionist hours. <laughs> oh, no, we've gone off topic. <laughs> we are a little bit off topic. That's okay, it's, that's what we do. Cam got ever watched a movie and went, hey, this is adapted from something. And then you looked at it and went, wow, this sucks. Like looked <laughs> the at the... That, the thing that it was adapted from. Hmm, I mean... I mean, kind of. Not a movie, but a TV show. Mm -hmm. Um, There's only been one instance in my life where it was like, oh, the book is worse than the adaptation version um, with with a caveat. So anyone who's listening to this, don't start typing an angry comment in my direction or email in my direction until I finish the sentence. When I first watched the first season of the CW's The Hundred, I really enjoyed the concept. I enjoyed like I enjoyed the first season. And then I saw in one of the credits that it was based off of a series of books by an author named Cass Morgan. 
And I'm me, and I know from experience, from my own personal experience, that usually the book is better than whatever is adapted to screen. This was only a few years after the Percy Jackson movie, so I was kind of calibrated to think that. And so I went uh, to my library, and I got all three books, and I read them, and compared to the TV show, they were, as the kids say, not it. They were not it. They were not, as the kids say, giving. Um, It was very much like lower YA, like almost middle grade audience. None of the like darker, more... um, disturbing, shall we say, themes of like a post-apocalyptic society were really touched on to any depth at all in the books. Um, It was kind of like in the TV show, they took what was done in the books and cranked it up to 11 in the show because it was like an actual post-apocalyptic story unfolding in front of the screen. And I was like, okay, the show is actually like not even, I won't say better because I'm sure a lot of other people enjoyed the books, but it was more to my taste and actually felt like post-apocalyptic fiction in the way that to me, the books felt like they were trying to be post-apocalyptic and failing miserably. And obviously the hundred crashed and burned, as we all know. But the first couple seasons were good, and I really enjoyed them. And compared to the books, um, the books just fell really, really flat for me. Um, The adaptation was much stronger than the original. But that's the only experience I can really think about where... Because, like, by contrast, my first ever exposure to the world of Percy Jackson and the Olympians was the first movie. And then I read the books, and the books were way better. (laughs) So I really experienced both sides of this in, in in my life. Yeah, I am particularly a much more prolific reader than I am a watcher of things. So generally, I tend to have read it first and then watched it if there's an adaptation with like the one exception being anime and manga because I... Mm, Same. And I guess comic books in general because I am a really fast reader, so I tend to not generally get comic books or graphic novels or manga much because I will run out of content. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Me binging like a 200 fucking chapter manga in one night. <laughs> Actually, I do have something that uh, the adaptation is better than the original, and I don't care if it's heresy. Fight me. The oh, Kingsman boy. movies are better than the comics. And I- I've only read some of them. I have some of them on my phone. I started reading them on that uh, most recent long road trip, and I was I was kind of disappointed. It really wasn't that great. Um, mm. And I was just like, man, I mean, I knew it would be different, but, like, the movie is just better. It's... So, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Kingsman movies, um, go strap yourself down. It's fun. It is a self-aware, intentionally cheesy Bond film. Like, that's... That's the movie. And... The comic doesn't quite have that. I, I liked the cheese. Kind of some of the silliness to it. Really? I, I, I've seen the movie, but I've never... I didn't even know there were comics, but that, that feels like such a core element of the story to me. Yeah. and And to be fair, I only got, like... 30% of the way through the uh, the comic book itself, but yeah, it just wasn't it wasn't as good in my opinion. I really vastly preferred the statements made by the movie to the book. It's much funnier. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. It's it's funnier. Yeah, and I, I don't I don't know necessarily how popular that take is, so maybe I'm spitting straight heresy, maybe I am uh, preaching I mean, to the it, choir. It feels like a really say, legit thing. I was gonna say pulling food straight out of the fridge and putting it on your plate, but yeah, that works. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually not aware that the Kingsman movies were an adaptation. There's a lot of stuff like that. They too, say that like, in the oh. in the film itself, it says that it's an adaptation. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. L plus ratio. You'd be surprised, like, 90% of things are adaptations, <laughs> I feel like. I'm just illiterate. It's very possible common. that it's very possible that I read that and was like, oh, cool, and then immediately forgot, because I can sometimes be quite illiterate if I have a mind to be. It's a curse. Don't worry, I, I'm completely Ill- illiterate. I can't, I sudden, I can't, I've become that meme a lot of, like, I can't read suddenly, I don't know. <laughs> it can't hurt you. <laughs> I can't. That sign. That sign can't stop me because I can't read. I need to watch the Dune adaptations. Um, I read the book. 
Yeah, how was that? It's a good Goodness. book, but the point that Frank Herbert is making is one that I don't find interesting. Like, I understand why he's telling it. I, It's a good point to make. However, it's also not necessarily what I'm looking for when I want to read a book. It has been a minute since I've actually read Dune, but I've seen uh, Denis Villeneuve's adaptations, and they are good movies. I saw the black and white adaptation. I have not seen Dune or read the books, um, mostly because the books seem really, really dense, and I don't really have the brain cells for dense books right now, but I, I, I'm curious about what the commentary is, because a lot of people have talked about it, like... The commentary is um, salient, so I, maybe my curiosity will get the better of me one day and I'll watch it. But today is today is not that day. Yeah, it is certainly salient to the modern day, and I understand why Frank Herbert wrote what he did. It makes sense. Like, I, it's a good message to have, but... If it's not your cup of tea, it's not your cup of tea. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even necessary that it's not my cup of tea, because I think there are ways of doing it that are my cup of tea. Uh, but also, I'm a little bitch, and I <laughs> dislike it when the characters that I like uh, are bad people. And I mm. get very attached very easily. Gotcha, show me a person. Gotcha. The first person you show me, and I'm going to latch on like f***ing glue. I didn't realize you were a jinx apologist. You can't see my facial expression or the movements I'm making with my hands. <laughs> yeah, so I just win. <laughs> but I am generally waving them about. Another win for the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, how are we? Unhinged. Also, and on time. <laughs> we're approaching an hour. <laughs> we didn't even get to mention Vox Machina. Fun adaptation. I am... Um... Completely forgot that that show starts with a sex scene and then recommended it to my professor once. Yeah, that one was immediately mortifying right afterwards. I like right after I said it, I was like, oh, shit. Full front <laughs> Honestly, uh, if this is a college professor, not even close to the worst thing that they've seen, probably. Like, I'm sure it's fine. Oh, certainly. Do we have anything in the mailbox before we get off, Ian? Oh, uh, we do not have anything new in the mailbox at this time. So if you want to reach out to us and share your thoughts on whether the book is better than the movie, or controversially, whether the movie is better than the book... You can email us. Our address is fanfictapes at gmail.com. You can also leave us a comment on our YouTube channel, or you can leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We are also on social media for now, on Twitter, formerly X. Maya runs that channel. Yes, at fanfictiontapes, the capital F, the capital T, no spaces or dash. Uh, sometimes we post about episode releases on there when I remember. And when they're on time. And when they're on time. Our next episode will be on sports stories, uh, where we talk about types of stories you can tell with sports. Because there's actually a few of them, and there's something kind of interesting about it. And yes, this is inspired by a certain piece of fan fiction. Shush. I'm very normal, I swear. Uh huh. Cam, before we go, yes. Do you have anything you'd like to promote to our listeners? Uh, sure. So you can find me on YouTube and on TikTok for as long as that lasts. I'm Hello Cameo on both places. The YouTube channel so far is me kind of porting over a lot of my TikTok stuff. But if you want to talk about the locked tomb or see my other eye crimes, hang out with me there. And I also have a podcast. It's called Hey Besties. It's Cam from the Internet. So you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts. See, I remembered to talk about it this time, gang. <laughs> Progress. Um, I know, right? And I also have a, a shop that you could find both on Etsy and on its own website. It's called Waywards Paper Co. Um, so if you type that into Google, you'll find me. I make pins and patches and stickers, and I'm preparing a pin 
Kickstarter campaign thing um, for pins based on my cat. So if you've ever wanted enamel pins of a cat with really big ears, don't worry, I got you and your very niche interest. <laughs> but that's it. Oh, I'm also on Twitter for as long as that lasts as Hello Cameo with two underscores after it. So if you want my unhinged shit posting there, um, good luck and Godspeed to you, but I am there. I don't think you've promoted your Etsy shop on here before. No, I haven't. Mostly because I was waiting for there to be a non-Etsy option for folks who don't like Etsy. But there is now. I have mm, my own website. Mm. I'm very proud Excellent. of this thing. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to prod you to mention the pins um, today because you have the, <laughs> the warden pen thing going on. Yes, my cat's name is Warden. He's a nice young man. And yes, he is named after the locked tomb character. And I was welcomed into the Pintopia 2 project on Backerkit, which is kind of like a Kickstarter-adjacent crowdfunding platform. And uh, as part of Backerkit's Pintopia 2, I'm making pins inspired by my cat. And one of the pins is him with a bag over his head, which is really funny. So you should check that out. <laughs> I'll be posting the details about that on Twitter quite liberally, so you can find my Twitter and thus find the Warden pins. But yeah, that's me. I do a lot of things. Oh yeah, also depending on when you're listening to this, I will be at two conventions if you want to come hang out with me at the Artist Alley. I will be in Virginia Beach's Tidewater Comic Con in May and New York City's Flame Con in August. So you can look those up and come hang out if you're in those areas. Unless something has gone very wrong, this episode will definitely be out before do both of those dates. Perfect. Then you can come hang out with me and... See me in person. I'll show you approximately 10 million pictures of my cat. Maya knows this. Yes. We met in person and I subjected you to multiple videos of that creature. I have no regrets. Indeed you did. There are There is nothing to be regretful for. <laughs> All right, folks, that is going to be everything from us for today. This is an unusually long trope talk and it's actually <laughs> a full length episode. I know. I am and have been Maya, pronouns she, her. And I was joined by... Yeah, me, Dylan. Um, always will be. Goodbye. And Cam, thank you for having me once again. It's always a blast. I'm our producer, Ian. Until next time. Bye!